So, um, first off, I want to say welcome to all of our people who are going to be performing for us, and that includes some of your peers, and that includes some community people, and so let's give everyone who's getting ready to perform or go ahead and teach us something, a round of applause for what you're going to do. We're excited about it. So thank you guys. Guys, it takes a lot of courage to get up in front of your peers. We talk about this all the time in our morning meeting, to get up in front of people and talk. Okay, as a student, to get up in front of 500 of your peers and talk, it's, it's a lot of courage. And so um, we're proud of you guys for everything you guys have worked for and done. And so thank you for getting ready to teach us about that. Okay? The next thing I want to say is, um, obviously, uh, the month of February is Black History Month. And um, we, we, we make sure that we take the time to go through that. I mean, there, there's some protocols in place. Well, it's part of your advanced ed accreditation, yes. Is it a requirement by South Carolina Public Schools? Yes. But there's some other things here that it's important to know about. And some students were saying, Mr. Pearson, why are we doing Black History Month? Why do we? And so I had my kind of answers. But then I was like, you know what? Like, I started looking on the internet for something a little bit more, um, well, better than what I had. And so I found this right here. This was actually from a White House, a White House briefing, okay? And it was entitled A Proclamation on National Black History Month. And so I'm going to read that for you. And hopefully, as you hear it, you can make some connections with that and understand a little more of why we do that. And then we'll get rolling with this. So, each February, National Black History Month serves as both a celebration and a powerful reminder that black history is American history. Black culture is American culture. And black stories are essential to the ongoing story of America. Our faults, our struggles, our progress, and our aspirations. Shining a light on black history today is as important as it's ever been to helping our nation become stronger. This is why it is essential that we take time to celebrate the immeasurable contributions of black Americans and honor the legacy and achievement of past generations, reckon with the centuries of injustice, and confront those injustices that still fester today. Our nation was founded on an ideal that all of us are created equal, and deserve to be treated with equal dignity throughout our lives. It is a promise we've not always fully lived up to as a country. Nevertheless, it's not something that we are willing to stop trying to do. The long shadow of slavery, Jim Crow, and redlining hold America back from reaching its fullest potential. By facing these tragedies openly and honestly and working together, with people to deliver on America's promise of dignity and equality for all, we become a stronger nation and a more perfect version of ourselves. Across the nation, across the generations, countless black Americans have demonstrated profound moral courage and resilience to help shape our nation for the better. Today, black Americans lead industry and movements for change. They serve in our communities and our nation at every level and advance every field across the board, including arts and science, business and law, health and education, and many more. In the face of wounds and obstacles older than our nation itself, black Americans can be seen in every part of our society, strengthening and uplifting all of America. And so for the next few minutes, which will be a little more than a few minutes, I ask that you guys kind of take some of those words there and begin to learn a little bit more because we're going to celebrate okay, the end of kind of this month and hopefully we don't end it here but we're able to take it forward with us as well as we find out more about black history. Okay, And so now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Barbuska who's going to introduce our first speaker. Let's give Mr. Barbuska a round of applause. Don Peppers is a native of Pendleton, South Carolina. Don found his calling in his hometown, where he spent the last 20 years advocating for youth of the upstate in South Carolina. He started studying film and uh, video production at the Art Institute of Atlanta, and he returned to South Carolina, where his career began to steadily shift from his original field of study to education and community advocacy. It was during this time that, quote, God got his attention, and he began to gain a solid reputation for teaching, coaching, and serving as a special education paraprofessional right here. It was also during this time with Anderson District 4 that Don received the Lighthouse Award. He was recognized as a humanitarian for youth and support staff of the year. 
In 2004, Don launched Camp Proverbs, which has now become Proverbs mentor Mentoring Organization. Due to his work with the Proverbs Organization, Don has been named United Way's Volunteer of the Month, and the Friends of the Park named him their Volunteer of the Year. He's been recognized by 107.3 Jams as an upstate black history maker and was featured on the cover of Anderson Magazine as an example of community mentoring at its most effective. Currently, Don serves as the Athletic Director for Anderson Christian School and continues his role as Executive Director of Proverbs Mentoring Organization. He also serves on the boards of the Anderson Cavaliers Football Organization and has been named the head coach, is that true, of the football team. The Parents Advocate Organization is a founding member, member of the Pendleton Rhinos Investment Group. Peppers and his wife Sheila share children Chris, Christian Sheldon, Caitlin, and Carrington. He's a devoted member of the Kingdom Vision Worship Center in Star, South Carolina. Please welcome Don Peppers as he brings us a pep talk on unity. Riverside, 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 Riverside. This is the best side. I used to, I know that because I spent 15, 17 years here in Riverside. And although this gym looks really different, looks much better than when I was here, some of the same faces that make this place great are still here today. And so for all those people who still continue the Riverside tradition of excellence, give them a hand. Give them a hand. On Monday, I'll have a chance to uh, go to uh, Pilton Elementary and serve with them. Y'all know Jeff Simpson, who, who had the pleasure of going to Pilton Elementary. All right, my good friend Jeff Simpson is the principal there. And they're having a, a Black History program um, centered around Unity. And one of the speakers who's going to be there is Chris Singleton. Anybody familiar with Chris Singleton? Okay, a few. Well, I, that's, that's kind of what I want to talk about in the spirit of Unity. Because when I was talking, thinking about a lot of different things, I thought back to where this, this part of my ministry started, the pep talk. Um, Chandler Moats um, actually gave, gave me that name. He um, said, you should start going to speak to uh, youth. And that door was open. But it started in that locker room, and in this locker room back here, speaking to the teams at Riverside Middle School. Trying to motivate them, trying to inspire them to get right on the court, on, on, on the football fields. And that's what pep talk was inspired. So now I get to go to different schools and civic organizations and give some pep talks on, 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 on life. But what better way to speak to people during this time than come from the word of unity? Unity. And when I look at Riverside Middle School, one of the things that always made it special was the diversity that it presents. When I look around, the beautiful thing is the diversity not only, not only of our skin tones, our ethnic backgrounds, our gifts and our talents, our gender. All those things makes us a beautiful, beautiful people. Unity and diversity at Riverside Middle School is why you're still one of the best middle schools in the, in the world. I believe that. I believe the reason why I was able to win a lot here is because I had a, a diverse group, a diverse group of athletes who came together for one common cause. That was to make Pelton proud, to make Pelton look good. And so I follow Riverside now and I still see great success here. But none of it could be done if you guys didn't have a unified approach to win. A unified approach to win. So I'm going to go back to Chris Singleton and, and why he inspired this message today. And I, and, and I won't be long. You know, y'all you know, used to those Baptist preachers who tell you that they'll take about an hour. I'm not a preacher. So I got 10 minutes, right? 10, 12. All right, but let me tell you a little bit about Chris Singleton and I, and I hope that you'll go look him up. If you're familiar with an event, a tragic event that took place, um, a while back in Charleston, South Carolina, there was a shooting at a church called uh, Emmanuel AME. <clears throat> Nine uh, people were murdered by Dylan Roof 
as they started to pray. And one of the mothers who, who was murdered in this specific uh, incident, her son, her son, who was a young man at the time, he had a heart to forgive. How can you forgive someone who murders your mom? Not only your mom, but other people who acted as mentors and your pastor and, 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 and church moms who helped raise you. And then after he gets over this, he decides that he can forgive Dylan Roof, the murderer of his mom. Well, it wasn't a simple form because America, anytime there's, there's a bit of adversity, you see it all on the media, every time there's something that happens, no, I don't care who the, who the guilty parties are, America has a way to want to continuously divide. Players against each other. Race wars. You gotta hate them. You gotta hate the police. You gotta hate this black guy. You gotta hate this one. You gotta hate this one. You gotta look down on this one. You gotta look down on that one. And it drives me crazy. I feel one of my gifts is to unify people. And so when, when I heard the story, I had to ask myself, could I do, this, do the same? Even as a Christian young man, where well, love endureth all things. So his rallying cry was that he could forgive because love was greater than hate. Y'all say that with me. Love? Say it right after me. Thank you. Love, love is greater, greater than hate. Than hate. Than hate. So that's where unity comes in. Yeah, we're the United States of America, but sometimes I think that young people, y'all may think that we're the divided states of America because everybody's always trying to tear us apart, right? But you got to be conscious, just as this young man was, to say, you know what? This is this is the reason why he could could forgive because he had to reflect on his life. He grew up as a baseball player. If I can be real, there's not many of African Americans who's out there. You know, knocking the ball around, right, coach? Not many, right? So he grew up around predominantly, you know, white kids. But they were his teammates growing up. So how could he forget about the, those people who loved him, that he built relationships with, after just one incident that could make him be a racist toward all white people because of one guy? He said, no, man, hey, listen, I, I had teammates. I spent nights over to their homes. Their parents took me in. We went on trips together. We played ball together. I know that that love was greater than what I'm feeling right now towards Dylan Roof. So now, Chris Singleton gets to go all over the world. Now, thanks, I'm going to go into South Carolina on Monday to spread this message of forgiveness and of love. So as a coach, as a coach, I understand that I may can have a star player, but that star player is nothing. So just say, take the quarterback. He is nothing without that offensive line. He's nothing without his receivers, his running back. He's nothing without his defense. And they have to have a unified approach to win in life, to win the game. But how about us, as Americans, us at Riverside Middle School, administration, and the children, students. Can we be unified and that we're going to love each other in spite of our differences? Instead of always tearing down and hating and bullying and belittling and making somebody feel like they're less than? I can't preach at school, but I say I give you this. John 10 and 10 says, the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I like the second part of it because it says, but I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And let me tell you where the abundance is. It's when we can love one another. It's when, when, when we can celebrate the wins that each one of us will accomplish because each one of you are significant. Each one of you 
are significant. And you have something to offer to this great school, this great community, and the world as you continue to get older and discover that. But there are some people who will try to kill that gift in you. But I want you to rise above it. I want you to rise above, rise above it. Because if we've been taught anything through Black History Month, there were some great examples of people who chose to rise above it and fight for the rights of all people. And young people, you're stronger and wiser today than any generation ever. You're more outspoken. So whatever you believe in, whatever it seems like something that, that, that convinced you to speak up and the, and, and the hope that you can love and bring unity to one another, speak out. Stand for, stand for those. And in closing, Pete, come with me real quick. Now, Peterson, pretty good fella right here, right? He's still a good fella. He used to be pretty, a really good fella. Just played a lot of basketball together. But Peterson and I had a lot of talks on race. On race. He adopted a young African-American child, and he was learning how to follow him. And we would have some conversations about the culture. But Peterson, this kid is now 15, Will, 15 years old, and, and that's still his son. That's his son. The only way that that can happen over the years, and I'm sure there's been some difficult times, some moments if you wondered why, but the only reason why that can happen is because of the four-letter word. Four-letter word that overcomes all things. Love. L-O-V-E -E is the most powerful thing. It's the most powerful thing. Get that in your hearts. Keep that in your hearts, no matter what comes your way. And we can do the unthinkable. God bless you. Friday and the weekend is Friday. Excellent. Before we start that weekend, we have another treat from this Black History Month celebration, and that is we get to listen to our outstanding Riverside 8th grade band perform. Let's give them some love. Tell us a little bit about the song, the number they're going to perform. We have eighth grade band member and speaker, Miss Whitney Becker Greer. So let's give her some love. We Armstrong made one a wonderful world, a time was passing. Armstrong was born in New Orleans in 1901 and grew up in a neighborhood so rough that was called Bounty. In 1912, he was arrested and sent to a boys' home. And that's where he learned to play the Mariah, which changed the path of his life. Louis Armstrong was a civil rights pioneer, one of the most influential artists in jazz history, and one of the America's most famous trumpet players. He also had an iconic voice. Although many artists have recorded What a Wonderful World, Louis Armstrong recording is probably the most famous. The lyrics of the song talk about some of the beautiful things in this world, such as blue skies, colors of the rainbow, and the kindness people show each other. It reminds us that even though there are a lot of heartbreaking things that happen around us each day, there's also a lot of beauty in this world. Now Jackson and I will perform Theo and Wes's hit song, What a Wonderful World, made famous by Louis Armstrong.
Go give it up one more time for them. I can just hear Louis Armstrong singing that just right here, at those, that duet, that was awesome. All right, uh, in continuance of our Black History Month, we're gonna have some student presenters uh, showing you some of their projects. So first up, uh, the seventh grade presenter from Mr. Barbusa's class is Gia Andruby, who will be telling you about Booker T. Washington. About Booker's life, Booker T. Washington was born in Halesburg, Virginia on the day of April 5, 1856. He unfortunately passed away on November 14, 1915 in Tuskegee, Alabama from complications with hypertension. I will permit no man to narrow and degrade my soul by making me hate Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was most of the was one of the most influential spokesmen for African Americans between the years of 1895 and 1915. He was also the principal developer and first president of Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute, which is now known as Tuskegee University. He was one of the great and well-known educators for his time. He was also an author. He was the first African American man on the U.S. Postal Stamp. The T stands for Telegram and his, he was buried in front of his university. He was married three times, and at the age of nine, Washington was freed from slavery and moved to West Virginia, and his father was a white plantation owner. Booker T. Washington impacted the U.S. in many different ways. First of all, he had an Amer African-American education plan and a political impact in the U.S. Booker had a vision for African Americans to become one with others and receive a good education. Mortia N. Washington, Booker T. Washington, and Ernest Davidson Washington was all of his kids. Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which he has overcome. Next up from Ms. Stevenson's class will be a presentation on Madam C.J. Walker by Ariana Dawson and Ivy Smith will be presenting that for us. Who was Madam C.J. Walker? Sarah Breedlove, who is better known as Madam C.J. Walker, was born on December 23rd in 1867 to her parents Owen and Minerva Breedlove. They were Louisiana sharecroppers who had been born into slavery. Madam C.J. Walker and her family lived in a small village in Louisiana called Delta. She was the first child out of five to be born free because of the Emancipation Proclamation. She was, the, she was an African-American entrepreneur and millionaire. She made her money from selling hair products for black women. She passed away on May 25th of 1919 in Irvington, New York. She's buried in New York, New York. Why did you? She established clubs for her employees, encouraging them to give back to their communities and rewarding them with bonuses when they did. Madam C.J. Walker is important because at a time when jobs were fairly limited, she promoted female talent, even stipulating in her company's charter that only a woman could serve as president. Madam C.J. Walker gives back. In 1908, Madam, in 1908 Walker opened a beauty school and, and factory in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, named after her daughter. In 1910, Madam C.J. Walker's company employed over 3,000 people, mainly black women, who sold Walker's products door to door. Walker's reputation as an entrepreneur was matched only by her reputation for philanthropy. She donated generously to educational causes and black charities, funding scholarships for women at the Tuskegee Institute, and donating to the NAACP, the Black YMCA, and dozens of other organizations that helped further the advantages for black communities accomplishments. She came up with a treatment that would completely change the black hair care industry. Her products like the wonderful hair grower, glossine, and vegetable shampoo began to gain a low following, changing her fortunes. Madam C.J. Walker's impact. Madam C.J. Walker was known as the first black woman in America, black woman billionaire in America. 
She made her money from her own line of hair care products for black women. In one article it says, she was inspired to create her hair products after an experience with hair loss, which led to the creation of the Walker system of hair care. She had a scalp disorder that caused her to lose much of her own hair. Her method of hair care, known as the Walker system, involved scalp preparations, lotions, and iron combs. In 1908, Madam C.J. Walker opened a beauty school and factory in, Pits in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which she named after her daughter. In 1910, she moved her business headquarters to Indianapolis, which was a city that had access that had access to railroads, which allowed for better distribution to the large population of African American customers. She made these sacrifices in moving and creating businesses without any clue of the success that they could or could not receive. This shows how courageous and strong of a woman she was. She was an inspiration to many other women and men to go out and chase their dreams. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our next performer. Um, she is a woman of many hats and she is our custodian, but she's also our cheerleading coach. But give a warm welcome to Miss Fowler. His eyes is on the sparrow, and the reason why I chose the song to sing is because every single morning when you guys come in, and my eyes are on you, and it's just like you know, it's just like Jesus Christ. I got to watch you all the time because I feel like all of y'all are my angels when you come in in the morning. And same thing with the teachers when I see them, you know, I'm, how you doing? How you doing? You know, you know, I just want to know. Make sure that everybody is happy when you come in. Same day, you should feel the same every day. It takes too many muscles to frown and less muscles to smile. Okay, y'all remember that? Okay, here we go. Why should I feel discouraged and
Miss Fowler. Let's give her a little more love. Now, once again, we're going to be treated to listening to our outstanding eighth grade band. And to tell us a little bit about their next selection is eighth grade band member Emma Whirl. Come on up, Emma. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's see some love. American spiritual that was first published in 1861. The composer of the spiritual is unknown, but it's believed to be the first spiritual written down. The text is based on Exodus chapters 3 and 4 and was originally published in a Northern Abolitionist newspaper in 1861. However, the spiritual was sung long before that. Many people believe that the Pharaoh in the spiritual text symbolizes enslavers and that Moses symbolized Harriet Tubman. Here, members of 8th grade clarinet section and Isaac Ladner uh, performing Go Down Moses. Something happened that he would never forget. 
His younger brother died after, and after that, at the age of seven, he turned to grind for the rest of his life. Ray Charles was a good African man. He was remembered for a lot of things. One of the things people might remember him is for the gap between R&B and jazz, gospel community. Ray Charles was a big fan of R&B, but he really loved jazz the most. So he may have played the jazz. And jazz became more popular while he was arrived. Jazz was still pretty big, but he, he made a new wave. Ray Charles really did help out a lot of people. He helped Af American music by creating a space for R&B, and this made people want to stop music career or to do something music. Because he was like the god of R&B back then, so people had nobody else to look at in the music industry. Ray Charles wanted to help younger people to make their dreams come true, so he helped African Americans do. Ray Charles was also called a genius or the father of soul, because his pitch was perfect and his voice was amazing. And he combines his songs with country, jazz, and sad blues. People said right when they heard his music, they started to dance. These, work, these recordings would make Charles famous and mark the beginning of a new way of soul. Ray Charles integrated American music by creating a space for gospel and fuse and R&B music on part radio. Charles also made people make new technology, like human devices that continues to advance providing more airplanes to deaf people and bringing the word of sounds one step closer so deaf people can do the same thing, same thing as us. He contributed to the industry of country music, rhythm, and blues, and pop music during the 1960s, with his crossover success on ABC Records, and had two albums at the time. While he was on ABC Records, Charles became one of the first black music musicians to be granted artistic control by a mainstream record company. More facts about Ray Charles. Ray Charles won a Grammy Award in 1960 for the song Georgia on my mind. He also won a Grammy for Hit the Road Jack. But throughout Ray Charles' career, about it and a into heroin, but he managed to kick the habit at a in LA. His favorite food was red beans and rice. Ray, Ray Charles was fired when he watched his brother drown on front of him. Next up, we'll be telling us about a presentation about Benjamin Banneker, is one of Mr. Harrington's students, Caitlin, Caitlin Herson. As you know, I did my Black History Month project on Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker was born November 9, 1731, in Elcott's Mills, Maryland. Sometime during the month of October, 1806, he died in Baltimore. So why is he historically significant? Banneker educated himself in astronomy and advanced mathematics. He constructed irrigation systems for his farm and made an entirely wooden clock. This clock kept at time for 50 years until Banneker's funeral, where his house was burned down. In the late 1780s, Benjamin Banneker used his astronomical calculations to predict a solar eclipse that would happen years later in 1789. He predicted the solar eclipse more accurately than famous astronomers. In 1791, Banneker was a surveyor for the land that would become the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. At the same time, he also wrote an almanac that had information on many things, such as medicine, tides, astronomy, locust cycles, and bees. Banneker's Almanac was published annually from 1791 to 1797. On August 19, 1791, Benjamin Banneker sent a letter to the Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, along with a copy of his almanac. Banneker urged Jefferson to fight for the end of slavery. How did he impact the United States? Benjamin Banneker's scientific achievements, along with his correspondence with Thomas Jefferson, changed the way that black people were viewed during the Federalist period. He was the first African-American intellectual, the first to publish an almanac, and the first to gain distinction in science.
I may be a little biased, but she did a very wonderful job. Let's give all the presenters some more love. And now to tell us about their next selection, Wade in the Water, is Alexis Alfonso. Let's welcome Alexis. Wade in the Water is often associated with the runaway slaves led to freedom by Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman had been enslaved herself, later escaped, and then helped lead others to freedom. She was the conductor of the Underground Railroad and would also view and also served as a scout spy and nurse for the Union Army during the Civil War. Tubman was never caught and never lost a passenger on the Underground Railroad. She used to song Wade in the Water to elect people she was guided to freedom. This is Michael Sweeney's arrangement of Wade in the Water performed by Riverside Middle School in Great Symphony. South, 
Florida and the Modern Civil Rights Movement in 2010. In 2002, he took over as director of Pan-African Center for Community Studies. In 2006, he created the Pan-African Studies Program at Clemson University. Currently, he is the professor of African American and Urban History at Clemson University, the vice chair of the South Carolina African American Heritage Commission, and the president of the South Conference on African American Studies Incorporated. Please welcome today's speaker, Dr. Abel Barley, as he brings us a message on building an economic floor, African American business people and inventors. Dr. Barley, come on, give a round of applause. Thank you, Mr. Peters. I need to start taking you with me as my hype man. I want to thank you all for inviting me back here again to speak to you all. I never take these opportunities lightly. I'm going to try and be short. You're going to tell me my time is up. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some African American business people and inventors, some of which I want to applaud the young people. I hope you all take my classes one day at Clemson because you did a great job. Better, as good as the students I have teach at Clemson with your research. So I really want to, I was very impressed. I want to start out with a poem that I, when I speak, I like to start out with a poem from one of the, my favorite South Carolinians, Dr. Benjamin Mays. Dr. Benjamin Mays was the mentor to someone you've probably heard of. Dr. Martin Luther King, when Dr. King was at Morehouse College. And Benjamin Mays has a poem that I, I use as my sort of a model for my life. I only have a minute, just 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, I did not choose it, but I know that I must shoot it. Give account if I abuse it, suffer if I lose it. Only a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Dr. Benjamin Mays' poem, God's Minute, and I would encourage you all to learn that poem. That's really one of, my great, one of the great poems. But today I want to talk to you about African-American business entrepreneurs. Some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have heard of. I was doing some research. There are 15 African-American, there are 15 people of African descent who are billionaires in the world. Nine of them are from the United States. And the newest one was an entertainer called Rihanna. She, she became the newest African-American business uh, billionaire. But today I want to talk about the, the people who, who preceded them, the ones who came before them. And I'm going to give you some background on some of the people who were both inventors, who uh, worked to help develop our business, and also uh, people who were important. I want to start out with this man, Dan Medford. He was a, a mixed-race immigrant who came to the United States and he saw a problem that the United States, that, that industry had. He grew up uh, in a period where it was difficult for African Americans to get a job. He got a job working in the shoe industry. And there was a problem that the shoe industry had. And that is, they did not have a way to sew the sole to the shoe to the top part of the shoe. And there were a number of inventors who were trying to come up with ways to do it. At the time, England was number one in the world for, in the shoe industry. And the United States was second. And so he got a job working in the shoe industry. He, he, he looked at the problem because what they would do is they would hand sew. If you look at your shoe, there's two parts. You have a sole and you have a top part. The problem was how do you sew that top part to the sole? And so he looked at the problem and he came up with a shoe lasting machine that actually worked. A number of people had been trying to invent this machine, but he invented it, he got the patent for it, he sold the patent, and as a result, he transformed the United States shoe industry. America was number two behind Britain, but after his invention, the United States became the world's leader in shoe manufacturing. We can make shoes faster than anyone else. We can make shoes of better quality than anyone else. 
And as a result, the United States took over as the world's leader in the shoe industry. And when you look at your shoes and the dominance of shoes, your Nikes or whatever, the United States gained this dominance mainly because he invented a shoe lasting machine that actually worked. And the world began to use the machine. And as a result, the shoe industry took off. We were able to reduce the cost of shoes. We were able to mass produce shoes in much better, in an easier way. And he became one of the heroes of the industry. And as a result, the Massachusetts area became the area, the center of the shoe industry in the United States as a result of Jane Metzinger's invention of shoe lasting machine. All right. I want to talk a little bit about Elijah McCoy. Elijah McCoy is another very important inventor of this period. Elijah McCoy, born on May 2nd, 1844. His family uh, escaped slavery, and he gets a chance to uh, move north for a while. He begins to work in the railroad industry, where there's, there have a lot of problems in the railroad industry. One of the things, if you study trains, trains have a difficult time stopping. And it, with the metal, hitting the metal, it really wears out things. So he began to do all kinds of research trying to find a way to help the train stop better, but also help machines run better. And so he began to investigate ways to lubricate parts so that American industry could run more efficiently. And he came up with a number of inventions which help automatically lubricate machines, which then allow the machines to work longer, and if the machines are working longer, they're producing more, and if they're producing more, the company makes more, and as a result, Elijah McCoy's machine transforms again American industry. His machines were so much in demand that people began to make cheap copies of them, and as a result, People began to ask when they bought a machine, is this a real McCoy? Which is where we get the term, the real McCoy. Because they wanted to make sure when they bought the uh, lubricating machines that they would get an original one, uh, an actual machine. And that's where we get the term, the real McCoy. And Elijah McCoy, again, he helps transform American industry. More than 60 patents under his name, which was an amazing event for an African American working in a small machine shop. Elijah McCoy is one person that we should really take note of because he transforms American industry with his inventions. When I was in Ohio, I spent 10 years at the University of Akron, and I was, one day I was sitting in my office I was a teacher at the University of Akron. I was sitting in my office, and there were about four ladies who came to my office, and they were probably eight minutes older than Moses. They were not young ladies at all. They came to my office, and they said, Dr. Bartlett, why are there no African Americans in the Inventors Hall of Fame? And the Inventors Hall of Fame is in downtown Akron, Ohio. It was less than three miles from my office at the time. And so they got me, we walked down to the Inventors Hall of Fame, and sure enough, there were no African Americans in the Inventors Hall of Fame initially. So I talked to the director, he said if I could prove that African Americans had actually invented something, he put some in. And one of the things that was most intriguing to me was because this man, Grandville T. Woods, was born in Ohio, not far from Akron, about 120 miles from Akron, and his inventions were listed in the patent office. It was not hard for me to find African Americans who had invented things. But Granville T. Woods is one of the most best known African American inventors of the late 19th, early 20th century. He invented, he invented a number of products that we still use today. When you think of the telephone, I say, who invented the telephone? You think of Alexander Graham Bell. And you would be right. But 
Alexander Graham Bell's phone work because of the invention of the things that Granville T. Woods did. He invented the process that allowed us to have communication using telegram and telephone connections. He's one of the uh, most important people in the United States when you think of communication. It allowed us to have much better communication on business. Think about it. Before this time, you had to write letters if you wanted to communicate, or you used the telegram. By having open communication and direct communication, you could talk to the factory. The factory could talk to the to the uh, the managers, and you could get exactly what you needed in the market. Louis Latimer, another very important inventor when you study uh, invention. Louis Latimer was a draftsman who worked for some of the most important companies uh, that dealt with, dealt with electricity. He worked for Westinghouse, he worked for Thomas Edison. Usually when we ask, when I ask people who invented the light bulb, everybody says Thomas Addison, Edison. Well, he, that's right and that's not right. It was actually Louis Latimer who came up with the first incandescent light bulb that actually worked. But he, because he worked for Thomas Edison, Edison got the credit for it. But when people talk about, when people talk about who is most responsible for electric lighting, it is Louis Latimer who transformed the lighting industry. Before his work, we used to have to light buildings either with candles or with gas lamp lanterns. Louis Latimer became an expert at lighting business. He knew where to put light bulbs to get the most light in the room. And he was so good at it that he went all over the world installing electric lights. Because there was only one of him, he just could not handle all the business, and so he sat down and he wrote the first textbook on how to install electric lights. And this book was used for the next 50 years. He was so much in, in, in demand. Louis Latimer is one of the most important people when you talk about American industry, as he transformed electric, electricity in the United States and the use of electricity. Thomas Edison used them, Westinghouse used them. He went all over the world teaching people how to use electricity. Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan is probably the most famous African American inventor, probably in history. Garrett Morgan is known for inventing two things that most people give him credit for or recognize. One, the stoplight. Now, let me be clear. There were stoplights before Garrett Morgan invented the stoplight. But here's where he transformed the stoplight. If everywhere you go in the world now, when you go, to, when you stop at a stoplight, I was in Shanghai, China, and I was amazed. There are three lights: red, green, and yellow. Before Garrett Morgan invented his stoplight, there were only two lights: red and green. And by introducing that third light, it dramatically reduced the number of accidents and it transformed driving in the United States. He had a car, he drove, he saw, he, he witnessed several crashes because when you drive, and just as soon as the light turns, you automatically hit the gas. And so he recognized that there should be a, a moment, a pause between the changing of the lights. And so he transformed us with the stoplight. The second thing he invented was the gas mask. The gas mask changes everything because it allows us to breathe when we're in smoke or when we're underwater. And people did not believe that it worked. And it just so happened that as he invented the gas mask, people were, they didn't know if it would really actually work. And there was an explosion. Men were under Lake Erie working in a mine, and they were trapped in the mine, and they used his gas mask where they pumped the air through a cord, and they were able to save the men. It was a dramatic uh, presentation, and it proved that his gas mask worked. And during World War I, when they began to use mustard gas and use other types of gas, everyone stole this idea for the gas mask 
and it allowed the soldiers to survive gas attacks during World War I. All right, Norbert Rouleau, real, real quick. Norbert Rouleau transformed the sugar industry by helping us invent, or helping us develop gelatins that work. When you, look, when you think about jello and those type of things, it was Norbert Rouleau's inventions that helped us develop jello, which used to be popular dessert, but not as popular anymore. But he transformed it by the things that he was able to produce with his invention, things like condensed milk, he created a much stronger glue. And of course, gelatin was his big invention. Here's one that everybody knows. George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver is probably my favorite inventor of all time. When I say George Washington Carver, everybody thinks of the peanut man. And you're right, he, invented, he, he didn't invent the peanut, but he transformed what we did with the peanut. But let me tell you why he was important. In 1915, there was a little bug that came from Mexico called the boll weevil. And this little bug ate the cotton crop. It ate in 1915, it ate in 1916. Cotton farmers were going broke. They had, they had no way to fight this boll weevil. And so they went to George Washington Carver, they said, what can we do? We can't make money off cotton, what can we do? And George Washington Carver advised them, I got an idea, why not grow peanuts? The problem was, nobody ate peanuts. So he went into his lab, and he invented a hundred, more than a hundred products that could be made by peanuts. Therefore, he created a market for peanuts and it transformed the people who plowed under their cotton and began to grow peanuts. And the first five people who did it all became millionaires because they followed his advice and began to grow peanuts. In fact, if you were to go to Enterprise Alabama today, downtown Enterprise Alabama, there is a statue, not <laughs> to George Washington Carver, but a statue to the boll weevil. And they praised the boll weevil for eating the crop, which then forced them to grow peanuts, which then made them millions of dollars. But George Washington Carver transformed the peanut, because think about it, peanut butter, peanut butter, they said peanut butter was already here, but he, he uh, popularized peanut butter, peanut brittle. All, all the peanut pecan pie, all those things were the idea of George Washington Carver. He transformed what we thought we could do with the peanut. The other, fruit, the other thing that he transformed was a potato. People did not eat potatoes that much. Well, he came up with more than 100 products that you could make from the sweet potato and the white potato. And it transformed the potato industry also. Let's talk about someone most of y'all have probably never heard of, and that's a man by the name of Joseph Lee. Joseph Lee is someone that everybody should understand or know about, particularly if you plan on being in the restaurant industry. Joseph Lee was a restaurateur in Massachusetts, African American restaurateur in Massachusetts. He saw a problem in the, in the food industry. People were throwing away bread, or they were cutting off the crust on bread and throwing that away. And he came up with an idea possibly we can use those, that crust to do something with. And so as a result, he invented a machine which allowed him to take the, the bread that was left over and turn it into something workable. And it is where we got croutons from. It is where we uh, now use uh, the leftover bread to make stuff like fried foods, all those things. It's the result of his invention that he invented and the other thing he was able to do, he allowed us, his invention allowed us to knead bread much quicker and much easier than before. The machine could do it way better than any human hands could do it. And he became a very wealthy man by inventing this product. In fact, he was very smart. He did not sell a patent. Instead, he worked with other businessmen to make sure that, that the, his bread uh, machine worked well. And as a result, he became one of the wealthiest men in the United States. 
and got several people to invest in his bread. His, his, he had a huge hotel, luxury hotel in Boston, where he served uh, exquisite food to Boston's upper class. But what it was, he was most known for was the way he was able to transform the bread industry in the United States with, with what he came up with as far as bread crumbs were concerned. Alright, let's talk about William Leedsdorf. William Leedsdorf was one of the founders of the city of San Francisco. He was an African American who moved to California from, at the time, California was part of Mexico. He moved to Mexico, he became one of the first people in the city council. He invested in San Francisco, in the, in the area, before 1849. After 1849, San Francisco tra is transformed because they have the gold run. But before that period, he was there investing and building the city, and he became one of the wealthiest people in California early on. William Leedsdorf, he's a person that people History has somewhat forgotten, but he's very important because when you think of San Francisco, it is the jewel of California. You've ever been to California? He's one of the founders of San Francisco. He was the one who recognized the significance, the significance of that city. All right, let's talk about a couple of African American women. Let's talk about Mary Allen Clinton. She is again one of my favorites. She had took over, she married into some money, and then when her husband died, she took the money that he left her and made it even more. I heard someone earlier say that Madam C.J. Barber was the first millionaire, African American millionaire. Well, people now, historians are now saying that Mary Pleasant was actually the first millionaire. She uh, invested her money in a number of causes and a number of things and really multiplied her wealth. She was the first person to really underwrite the civil rights movement in the West. She used the of her money to underwrite civil rights cases, and she transformed what people thought and what people did in California because with her money. All right, let's talk about James Fortin real quick. James Fortin was born was, was uh, born during the early period of the of America's uh, Republic. He worked at a, in a, at a uh, shipping company, and when his owner retired. He took over the company, and he transformed this company into a major business shipping company for his, his, himself and his family. He invested a lot of his money into African-American causes because he wanted to help build the African-American community. When William Lloyd Garrison broke away from others in the, in the abolitionist movement and started his newspaper, The Liberator, Garrison did not have money for the newspaper. Well, it was James Ford who underwrote the first African American, or first newspaper to advocate for immediate, uncompensated emancipation for African Americans. And this made him one of the most important figures during the evolution of, during the abolitionist period. Another one that people tend to know, Benjamin Banner. Benjamin Banneker was another very important figure in the African American community. Benjamin Banneker was an inventor, he was an astronomer, he was everything. He was born, his, his, he was born uh, of mixed race in the, in the uh, Maryland area. He was fascinated with the stars. And so his, he had a strange routine. He would sleep during the day and stay up all night watching the stars because he was really interested in the stars. He was also very interested in timepieces. He had a friend who had a watch, and he wondered, man, what if we could take the watch and put it, make it into something that everybody else could watch, look at. And so he created the wooden cuckoo clock. It was a clock that ran for 50 years. I don't know how many watches were run for 50 years. It ran for 50 years, the, the first cuckoo clock that he, that he invented. But here's what also is very important. He was the person who helped lay the foundation for Washington, D.C. If you've ever been to Washington, D.C., there is a pattern for Washington, D.C. He was the one who laid the foundation for Washington, D.C. He was in charge of the survey team that laid Washington, D.C. Very important figure. He debated Thomas Jefferson. 
over the issue of slavery and whether or not you can say all men are created equal and yet own slaves. But the most important thing he did, during the revolutionary period, there were only two almanacs written. Now before you had the internet, and before you had encyclopedias, people would consult the almanac. There were only two of them written during the revolutionary period. Anyone know who wrote the first one? Anyone? Did your chances to be really smart? What if I give you the initials? BF. It was Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. He wrote Poor Richard's Almanac. The other Almanac that was written was written by Benjamin Banner. And Benjamin Franklin read Benjamin Banner's Almanac and he said, wow, your Almanac is actually more accurate than mine. And so, the second Almanac written in America was written by Benjamin Banneker, and it helped our farmers know when to plant, when to uh, harvest, because at the time they learned how to follow the stars. All right, let's talk about another important person that you all need to know about, and that's Magdalena Walker. Magdalena Walker was the first female in American history to be president of a bank. She was the president of the St. Luke's Penny Savings Bank in Richmond, Virginia. It was an incredible feat for a person, for, African, for a woman, and particularly African American woman during this period. The St. Luke's Penny Savings Bank was only, the, I think it was like the third bank ever in the United States for African Americans. And it was an important bank, and she was the president of this bank. In fact, when she took over, the bank was in economic trouble, and she transformed the bank. Magdalena Walker, and you can see a picture of her in the bank there. There were very few banks. There were only 14 banks in the United States for African Americans. And think about it. She was the president of the largest black bank, the St. Louis Penny, Penny Savings Bank there in Richmond, Virginia. And there's a, another edition of it. And, uh, an African American female president of a bank. Now, a couple more. When we talk about the automobile industry, everybody talks about Ford, Henry Ford, and how important Henry Ford was. Henry Ford was important. But one thing you do not know is that there were African Americans who were also involved in the automobile industry early on and making cars. And one of them was Mr. C.R. Patterson and son. They had a car company that actually made cars even before Henry Ford made cars. There were a number of car dealers or car producers and manufacturers in the United States before Henry Ford, and this was one of the few African-American car producers. They created their, they, they built a factory. They're all, they only made about 10 to 15 cars because they, at the time, before Henry Ford introduced the assembly line, people, we took a long time to make cars. But they, C.R. Patterson Company and Sons, they made cars for quite a few years. But then, once the Model T took off, they recognized that they could not compete. And so they switched up, and they began to make buses. And they made their money on making buses for school children. And that the C.R. Patterson Company became one of the most powerful car companies in the United States making buses during the 1930s. What happened was, as the depression got bigger, the company eventually went bankrupt. But it's interesting to know that there was an African American car company that was in existence during the early part of the 20th century. And I'm going to talk about a couple of more people. This man is also very important. Charles Clinton Spaulding. Charles Clinton Spaulding was the second wealthiest African American in the United States at the time. He was the president of the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. During this period, African Americans could not get life insurance. They could not get insurance. And so what they did was they started out by having what's called burial clubs. But then those burial clubs evolved into life insurance companies. And he was in charge of one of the largest 
companies in the United States, the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company. It is one of the few black owned insurance companies that are still in existence today in Durham, North Carolina. At one point, the company was worth $40 million during the 1950s. And Charles Spaulding was the second wealthiest person, well, second wealthiest African American, worth about $20 million at one point. He donated a lot of money to charities, he donated a lot of money to help African Americans in other ways, but he was one of the most important figures during the uh, early part of the 20th century. And this is one of my favorites, because I've written on him several times. And that's Mr. A.L. Lewis, Abraham Lincoln Lewis. Abraham Lincoln Lewis probably has one of the best stories of anyone. He was born in Madison County, very poor. He moves to Jacksonville, Florida, and he invests in a small company, small insurance company in Jacksonville called the Afro-American Life Insurance Company. This company takes off and becomes the second largest company, insurance company in the United States. And A.L. Lewis, as the leader of the company, becomes one of the wealthiest men in the South. He's the first person in the first African American in the state of Florida to have a salary of a million dollars a year. But here's what's important that he does also. There, during this period, African Americans could not go to beaches. And so he wanted to have a beach, a place where African Americans could go to relax, to enjoy themselves. And so he bought some property off the coast of Jacksonville, part of the New Beach area, called, a place called Amelia Island. If you play golf, you know where Amelia Island is. Well, the other half of Amelia Island, he bought the area and he created a black resort called the American Beach. And it became the most important resort area in the South. People who were traveling, African Americans who had money, who wanted to have, have some relaxing time, they would go to American Beach. And it was one of the few black resorts that were available in the United States. As a kid, I used to go to American Beach myself because one of the things you could do on American Beach that you couldn't do on any other beaches is they used to race cars on Sunday. Uh, on American Beach, and I, I just enjoyed going out there and watching people race the cars. But he created American Beach and became one of the wealthiest people in the United States and one of the wealthiest people in the, in the state of Florida. He also had a country club. He donated a lot of money to African American schools and charities. He was a member of the Negro Business League, which was an organization created by Booker T. Washington to help African Americans organize businesses. He was the first vice president of the Negro Business League. So he was a very important person, incredibly talented person. But he, had, he made himself a lot of money by transforming the Afro-American Life Insurance Company into one of the most wealthiest companies in the United States. All right, let's talk about a couple more. This woman is very important, Annie Minerva Cobra, uh, Kerber Cole Malone. We just heard a little bit about Madam C.J. Walker, but Madam C.J. Walker actually got her start working for Miss Annie Turbo Pope Malone. Annie Turbo Pope Malone had a very tragic life. Her parents died when she was young. She moved in with her sisters and brothers. She had a problem her whole life. Her hair was messed up. It was constantly coming out. It was very hard to manage. And she was just upset all the time because she had nothing to do, no way to manage her hair. So she began to work with chemicals which would relax African Americans' hair. She eventually came up with a number of formulas that worked. And as a result, she invested her money in a new company she founded called the Coral Company. This Coral Company hired literally hundreds and thousands of African American women. And what they would do is, they went around the United States and they would knock on the door and they'd say, they'd say can I speak to the lady of the house? When the lady of the house came in, they'd say, I can see your wig is tore up. I'll fix it for you for the first time for free. And then after that, you have to pay me for it. And she built herself a company, the Coral Company. And she hired a number of women, including Madam C.J. Walker.
these women would get trained by her at the Pearl Company, and they would go out and form their own companies. She at one time was the wealthiest African American woman in the world. Because in 1904, the St. Louis World's Fair, at the St. Louis World's Fair, she began to sell her products. And people in Latin America, South America, and Africa were introduced to her products. And she created a national or international market. And it caused her company to explode. And she became one of the wealthiest people in the United States. The problem that she had was so many of her workers stole her products and went and formed their own companies. But she created a number of very wealthy African American women, people who were trained in her school and then went out and set up their own companies, including Madam C. Day Walker. And quickly, Madam C. Day Walker. Madam C. Day Walker was also one of the wealthiest women in the United States. She got involved in the hair care industry. She created, she created what was called her wonderful hair girl. And she used this product to raise more than a million dollars for her company. The theory behind it was you used the shampoo and it actually caused her hair to grow. I've always wondered if that was true, but, it's, but people bought it anyway. She constantly relocated and built factories where, and she copied everything that uh, she had learned from any Pope Turbo Malone, and she became one of the wealth. In fact, she actually outdid Malone eventually, and her company actually became bigger than Malone's company. And those were two of the most important women. If you think about it, they transformed the beauty industry for African American women because before that time, African American women used things like goose fat and other things to, to manage their hair. Once these women took over, they transformed the hair care industry and they allowed African American women to change the standard of beauty. And it has been changing since. There are now even white companies now are selling African American beauty products and it started out with these women. And so, that's all I have to for y'all today. <laughs> Dr. Abel Bartley, everyone. Give him some more Riverside. our final performance, I just wanted to say something to all of you. I have been around a lot of middle schools and middle schoolers in my long, 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 very long career in education. And it never ceases to amaze me what great audiences, middle school audiences, the kids at River School are. Attentive, respectful, polite. So give yourself some love. Great job. <laughs> and now to tell us about our seventh and eighth grade chorus performance. Give some love to CZ Reed. More than a century, the Little Big Voice and Sing has held a powerful place in American history. The hymn is known as the Black Dance National Anthem, but it is more than that. It is a history lesson, a rally cry, a pledge of unity as people gather and fight for equality and justice. It is a present, an ever present refrain. Let the voice and sing is one is one time in history a proclamation and a vision of the future. It is immediately popular. It immediately became popular in black communities and institutions. In 1919, the NAACP proclamated it is a Negro national anthem. A full 12 years before the Star Spangled Banner was adopted, 
as our nation came forward. It became an important part of, black, of African American worship traditions and enduring refrain for all Americans of every color to so we celebrate progress, unity, and love. Today we sing with the big voice of the with pie and welcome everyone to sing along with us. Here for about 
I mean, an hour and 20 minutes has done a great job. I mean, church isn't even that long if you're going to church, okay? So here's the deal. You guys have done a great job, so give yourselves a round of applause.